The internet is dead. Nobody killed it, which is good, but it's also undead, which is bad. An interesting theory has circulated around 4chan's X board and other image boards recently. It's a fascinating, if extreme, idea. The dead internet theory. A belief that the internet has entered a state of automated cultural technological stagnation, or to quote the theory's thesis, large proportions of the supposedly human-produced content on the internet are actually generated by artificial intelligence networks in conjunction with paid secret media influencers in order to manufacture consumers for an increasingly range of newly normalized cultural products. A little theoretical, but the idea makes sense. Now, this is an image board theory by Anons, so bizarre and extreme points show up in it, often bordering on schizophrenia. But there is a body of research over two decades that substantiates the theory, to a degree. The internet has been hollowed out by algorithms, social media, and bots. Maybe calling it dead is an exaggeration, but the title is hyperbole. Compared to ten years ago, the internet feels… empty. Hollow like a balloon filled with air, the surface appears massive, but there's nothing in there. A sea that is a mile wide, but an inch deep. It's not a process of enclosure and sanitation, though it goes hand in hand with that, but something different. The elements of human creativity are being quietly pulled out and replaced with pure artificiality. The modern internet, in certain terms, is dead as in what was once human has withered away. The normal user is shoved ever deeper into a Skinner box of shadows. In his 2001 white paper on the deep web, Michael K. Bergman described the philosophical problem of the internet as, what cannot be seen cannot be defined, and what is not defined cannot be understood. Such has been the case with the importance of databases to the information content of the web. As databases have grown larger and ever more complicated, this problem has only increased. Now, it's also applied to everything else. It's time to perform an autopsy on the internet's bloated corpse. The dead internet theory, which cohered on 4chan's X board around the end of 2020, start of 2021, is massive. It spans one long post and several supplementary threads, but it can be boiled down to nine or ten major points. For simplicity, the arguments alone will be focused on here. It's an argument that the internet is largely artificial, if not outright fake. The anonymous poster's points boil down to these. 1. People seemingly cease to exist on the internet at random. Identities emerge, then vanish. The people behind them, if any, are never known. Even close friends on the internet have a habit of ceasing to exist after a few years. Now, it is the internet, but why leave so suddenly? Perhaps nobody was behind these profiles to begin with? 2. Certain content seems to be recycled or repeated on the internet. It's obvious on websites like 4chan, Twitter, and Reddit. Posters will always bring up the same topics and images. These same points start the same controversies over and over. It happens because it gets reactions and bumps threads, but this repeats endlessly, seemingly always belaboring the same things again and again. 3. The same news stories occur again and again. A similar issue to number 2, but with mainstream and independent news sources. The same things seem to happen every few years. It feels like reality is fetching the same set of news stories to repeat ad nauseum. Now, People are boring, but its culture is stuck on a few points. 4. A sense of literal internet mimetic evolution, or digital predestination. Everything on the internet seems to move towards a certain point in retrospect. The Anon in the Post traces a direct lineage from the old Raptor Jesus memes, to the bizarre chaos magic importance of Pepe the Frog, to the now dozens of splinter cults of cartoon frog image macros. A subpoint to this is the sensation each website exists to condition certain segments of the digital population. 4chan's Hackers on Steroids were guided by intelligence operations from Habbo Hotel raids to that one time Pol's Syria general thread helped coordinate a military strike in Syria. The founders of these websites rarely factor in and either disappear into the background or simply wither away. 5. The Increase of Sexual Perversion on the Internet. The internet has always been for porn, but there seems to be way more nowadays. 
There probably actually is. Every fetish exists and is catered to somewhere. Cannot go too deep into this one because, well, frankly, I just don't want to. 6. Algorithmic Fiction One of the more extreme positions of the theory, that all mass-marketed entertainment, movies, music, books, is generated by algorithms or AIs. It's a modern version of Roald Dahl's The Great Automatic Remanitizer. All fiction is produced by machines, which can only create a lifeless imitation. According to the theory, only anime is exempt from this, because it's from an anime image board. 7. Entire sections of the world are fake. People, events, and places are all deepfakes. Wikipedia allows entire biographies, cities, and historical events to be conjured out of thin air. It's impossible to prove since the internet exists in an omnipresent present. There's no past or future, really. You just exist. 8. The internet on the computer and smartphones is different. Are different? Essentially true with desktop and mobile sites, but this theory takes it further. These websites are too different. Each one, smartphone and computer, has completely different content when compared to the other one. You just have to pay attention. 9. Tech CEOs are totally aware of this and manipulated against one another for unknown goals. The internet is a battlefield of fake people fighting fake wars. AI systems already rule. So simple, right? There are extreme points, but it's from 4chan's paranormal board, so it is going to be off-kilter. Yet, it is closer to reality than may seem. Studies over the past 20 years indicate the internet may be deader than most think. It may have been this way since essentially the start. Start with the average user of the internet. An idea Harold Weinrich and Hartmuth Obendorf's 2006-2008 study not quite the average, an empirical study of web use, warns researchers away from with the statement, one has to be careful when speaking of the average user of the web. The Weinrich and Obendorf study is an empirical look on how users interact with web pages, and, as far as I can tell, it's the most recent study of its type, though now 15 years out of date. Not quite the average's age is a boon though because it examines the pre-social media internet. The actual study was performed in 2006, which was one or two years before services like Twitter and Facebook really took off. These statistics then, if anything, have likely fallen as quicker, snappier text has fried web users' attention spans. But what does it say about the 2006 to 2008 period then? Weinrich and Opendorf observed users are divided into two browsing styles, navigate and explore. The navigation style was those seeking a certain web page, or people who navigated towards one source from search results. The exploratory style is exactly what it says. Exploratory users were interested in exploring web pages, sifting through search results, and examining links. Though, as web pages have become more centralized around a central column of text, this exploratory style has probably decreased to some degree. The most common navigation actions, according to the study, were hyperlink clicks at 52% of clicks, back button clicks at 41% of clicks, and the other seven being other archival actions like printing. Though, later revisions suggest clicking on page buttons replaced back button for the second most common action a couple of years later. None of these statistics appear to have varied much by navigation style, similar with what the study discovered about location of click frequency. Almost half, 45%, of user clicks occurred in the upper left quadrant of the web page. Pre-2007 websites favored hyperlinks in the upper left of the screen. Social media then has likely realigned this to the center of the screen, but it's probably still true to some degree. What does all this technical interaction have to do with net quality though? It is in how much users read. That 79% of our test users always scanned any new page they came across only 16% read word by word. Even for 2006, 2008, that was not a comforting statistic. Not that scanning is inherently bad, you need it to pick up quick information, but another contemporary statistic does not improve the situation. In 2008, the Nielsen Group published the article How Little Do Users Read in direct response to the Not Quite the Average study. The Nielsen article found how much users read is highly variable by small word counts. The study concluded users generally only read at most 28% of the words during an average visit, 
but 20% is more likely on an average web page of 593 words. This percentage does fall with the increase of word count as well. And this was for experienced users too, so people who just take a quick look at the internet are likely even lower. The general conclusion of these studies is that the average internet user does not read that much of what they see on the internet. This is why everything on the internet looks the same. Marshall McLuhan's old adage that the medium is the message. But to explain, the Nielsen Group was able to conclude why the internet looks the way it does all the way back in September 1997 due to this. Readability. It's all about readability. Remember old personal web pages and early corporate websites? The internet used to look a lot more experimental, but homogenization conquers all. What won the internet was simplicity, concise text, scannable layout, and objective language. Nielsen's article, How Users Read on the Web, makes why this standardization occurred incredibly clear. The web pages that survived the digital Darwinian thinning process employed scannable text. Things like highlighted keywords, meaningful subheadings, bulleted lists, one idea per paragraph, an inverted pyramid style of writing that starts with the conclusion, and half the word count of conventional writing, so less than what you'd see in a book. The central column alignment of writing cohered to this, an optimized orientation. Articles have evolved into the apex predators of marketability. Okay, so the internet evolved so people would read it more, but maybe only between 16 and 28% actually do, depending on one's interpretation of read. What about what's on the web? There seems to be plenty of content, right? There is, but the whole story is a lot more bizarre. Follow along, it's complicated to explain. Google simply stops at some point. Or it appears to stop. Call it the Google conundrum. If a user searches a topic, the amount of estimated results will shrink as they navigate to the end of the search pages. What should be thousands of pages of results from millions of results is reduced to only a couple dozen pages. At most, even with omitted results. It simply stops. You shall not pass. Is Google lying? Attempting to make the internet seem deeper than it is? No, the number is an estimate. The actual explanation is just hidden from you. As Google explains, in addition, when you click on the next page of search results, the total number of search results can change. In this case, we realize that some of the query results are duplicates, and collapse those duplicates so that you can find the specific result you're looking for more easily. Collapsing the duplicates decreases the estimated number of results as well as the overall number of results pages. What Google is doing is collapsing duplicate, fake, and useless results. You can see this if you search the name of this YouTube channel, which I of course assume you are subscribed to, wink wink. Most of the results are only vaguely related with a lot of automated phishing web pages with barely related topics about my videos. What one is not seen in most search results is the amount of useless data in temporary web pages that would exist in them. It makes the internet appear shallow when it's mostly just junk. Search engines, Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yandex, only trawl the surface of the net. They spider or crawl the web by spinning off results from links and similarities between web pages. Though how this happens varies by website and company, so the service may be different depending. Back in 2006, Not Quite the Average found 98% of Google's search results were updated after 7 days or more, for example. Where is everything else? Hidden behind the curtain. What search engines do not index, people now know colloquially as the deep web. The deep web is the rest of the internet that cannot be easily accessed by search engines. It's mostly useless data, orphaned web pages, and mirrored websites, sometimes with illegal content. Hard statistics will always be blurry on it, but some statistics do place the content of the entire internet at being around 4% surface web versus 96% deep web, but that number may be outdated. Today, for example, Google indexes an estimated 5.27 billion web pages, but that also changes by the minute. In his original 2001 white paper on the deep web, Michael K. Bergman estimated, 
back in 2000, that search engines were only indexing about one in every 3,000, 0.03%, of web pages available to them, an astounding drop from 32% of the internet cataloged in 1998 to 16% in 1999 to around 4% or less today. A result of the deep web's unlimited growth potential as link rot, the death of hyperlinks to sources, withers older web pages away into orphaned obscurity. Though, as Bergman warned about this, there is no bright line that separates content sources on the web. There are circumstances where deep content can appear on the surface, and, especially with specialty search engines, when surface content can appear to be deep. The internet is always undergoing a state of natural electric rot, due to link rot, so solely falling into the deep web essentially, but often, humans cannot see beyond their tools. It is doubtless the algorithms behind search engines define what the internet is to most casual users. Algorithms now dominate search engines, social media, and yes, even YouTube. Algorithmic processes, by now, have near total control of every major website. Somewhat disconcerting, as Robert Kowalski defined the most basic definition of algorithm as logic plus control. Users are fish, and the algorithm is the water. A common observation is algorithms have near totally captured, and to some degree, quarantined off digital culture, a common accusation being algorithms have caused the perceived stagnation of digital culture, and thus the entirety of online culture. Algorithms are so distrusted because they serve as the internet's black boxes, a mechanism taken away in the background with little definition of what it is or does. Companies like Google and Facebook keep their algorithms as question marks to maintain market domination, a cracked or obvious algorithm endangers profit as it can be exploited or circumvented. Or, as Jay Rabarge in our Safer described in What Are Algorithmic Cultures, it threatens the Googleplex, internet megagiant's dominance, or near monopoly, on cultural creation and curation. Granted, the Googleplex concept in theory is not new. Cultural critic Neil Postman coined the term technopoly back in the early 90s to describe a similar issue at the time. Postman's definition was developed pre-mass internet adoption, but it still diagnoses a common enough problem to apply now. Postman's theory that, in technological society, the idea of if something could be done, it must be done, has replaced all concrete theory. Culture has been captured by the technopoly, which, as Postman defined it, is the submission of all forms of cultural life to the sovereignty of technique and technology. The core idea of technopoly is progress for progress's sake, without moral or even political direction. There is no such thing as value in itself, as the technopoly replaces all theory with the fetish of optimization. The internet has been optimized into a lobotomized state, as Roberge and Seyfert describe the fetishization of optimization through algorithms. That is to say, the fulfillment of this dream is always one step away from its completion. There is always only one more algorithm yet to be implemented. In other words, it is only such constant algorithmic misalignments that explain the existence of promises and hopes of a smooth algorithmic functionality. Sound familiar? Replace optimization with pointless updates, needless aesthetic changes, and bizarre technical choices that break social media and websites every year. True believers in technopoly see a purpose behind these things, while cynical developers use it to justify their salaries. The idea of good enough for a website or service makes developers redundant. From Adobe's subscription model, to the new Twitter timeline and new Reddit format, to even YouTube's talks about removing the dislike button, a feature you can literally turn off, tech giants are obsessed with the concept of the update update in abstract. User experience seems a secondary thought against buzzwords like modern and innovative. Ironically enough, the effort for a perfect website has destroyed all trust in these websites. A large segment of users have no trust in these massive universal websites because the second they grow accustomed to them, they change. Roberge and Seyfert called this concept the somewhat unnerving term of algorithmic production of trust. It obviously no longer exists, because, looking at their definition, in turn, users need to believe that their counterparts are real, ergo, they need to trust the social media platform they are using. Thus, the algorithmic production of trust 
is one of the most important mechanisms of social media platforms. People do not trust the platforms, nor, for the most part, each other, or they trust too much. What about other websites and forms? Why not those? Yes, there are obviously other places on the internet beside the five or seven major social media websites. One could discuss the scattered forms remaining, but social media has produced a rural urban divide online. I mean, literally online, in digital culture. To explain, social media has a digital brain drain effect. What has occurred online is comparable to the industrial revolutions of the early 1800s, or, as the English poet William Blake described it, these dark satanic mills. Social media websites are the urban centers or factories that consume the digital human capital of the online countryside. Forms are ruined, personal websites forgotten, and profiles packed up as users mass migrate to a few central hubs. There they face standardization to what can only be called the internet's metropolitan culture based around YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Tumblr, and other major sites. The immigrants from these smaller internet cultures then have to redefine themselves to fit each website's policy. Certain cultural traits remain among sub-communities and ghettos, but they too are solely homogenized and grow distant from their origins. A standardized internet language is laundered. Their shibboleths and image macros are integrated into the wider populace and usually sanitized in general forms. What about that populace then? Really nothing definite can be said about the internet populace overall. Even the old it skews younger is probably not true anymore, if it was ever actually true. It's impossible to say how many people actually use the internet. In 2012, a hacker estimated there were 1.3 billion global IP addresses, but that is not equivalent to users at all. It would be like saying the global population equals the number of vehicles in existence. Current estimates peg it at around 4.66 billion users, but that is only a ballpark number. In 2006-2007, Jay Leskovic and E. Horvitz used data from Microsoft Messenger's instant messaging system to estimate the links, or six degrees of separation, between people. Turns out, online at least, there are only about six people separating everyone online. 6.6 .6 to be exact. This may be why the internet often seems so small, as it selects for an exact population, then algorithms funnel these people into groups which persist across websites, or just some form of subconscious group preference. Or, as they described in Planetary Scale Views on an instant messaging network, social networks have been found to be highly transitive, i.e. people with common friends tend to be friends themselves. That's all sort of obvious though. Look at the actual content of social media then to see how distorted this dead web can be. Twitter. According to Pew Research Center in 2019, about 22% of American adults used Twitter. Down from about 23% in 2018, but that was also up from 20% in 2016. I do not expect it has changed much in the past two years. Though, today, 17%, one in five, adults are smartphone only internet users, implying they largely only access the internet through apps. Twitter's problem is it is far from representative of the actual American, and global, population. In a 2019 study where American adults volunteered their Twitter accounts, they had to directly connect themselves to it, so no anonymous accounts here, Pew Research Center found the top 10% of US Twitter users compose about 80% of the tweets. That highly active 10% of users is about 65% female, 69% say they tweet about politics, and generally lean left liberal. This highly engaged segment tweets about 138 times a month, compared to the astounding two times per month the other 90% do. By now, it's obvious Twitter has an amplifying effect on the top 10% since they produce the most content, as engagement equals attention equals advertising money. Or however Twitter doesn't make money. At least in regards to non-anonymous accounts, Twitter's system launders jokes slash ideas by a simple social model. PR Chamberlain developed the listener talker hub model of Twitter to explain how information is transferred across the website. It could also be called something like the spoke and wheel model. Hubs are users slash accounts that act as the main disseminators of information, largely influencers or that top 10% of tweeters. What spokes off from the hubs are talkers and listeners. 
hubs are accounts which repeat and transmit between or against other users. Listeners are those accounts who engage little and often only seem to follow or listen. Talkers are those that make the conversation though, and hubs echo it. Information usually flows outwards from the talkers or conversation makers. Twitter then is basically a one-way conversation happening over millions of people. Target or control hub users and you control the flow of information. Target talkers and you control the content of discussion. How genuine is that conversation? Eh, probably not very. Social pressure and gossip of the day are Twitter. Back in Twitter's early days, Nielsen observed an actual social contagion effect in regards to the H1N1 swine flu virus. On April 24, 2009, references to the H1N1 virus made up only 0.2% of tweets. The next day, April 25th, it was 2% of all tweets on the website. What about bots though? Do those impact the conversation? That is much harder to prove. Here are Twitter's own numbers on that problem. Trust them as you will. The 2013 annual report claimed 240 million monthly active users, but Twitter said that there were 10 million non-genuine, note the term, users. Fake accounts, duplicates, and bots. So, about 4.5% of the website's population in 2013 were fake, depending on how you define fake. So, has the fourth industrial revolution left the internet an actual Android warehouse then? Once again, it's hard to say, but take a look at Reddit. Reddit's voting system, though not unique to Reddit, has long been accused of creating false, easily fudgeable consensus. Positive feedback, seeing number go up, encourages repetition of content and opinions guaranteed to generate the greatest rewards possible. Involuntary self-optimization. The pool of 430 million monthly active users means returns are rarely diminishing, and because how Reddit's front page works. Reddit's system flaws have been talked to death, but like with Twitter, who is using that system? Reddit users are worthless. Not being cruel here, it's economically true. Back in 2019, Reddit's ARPU, average revenue per user, was believed to be about 30 cents. So the average Redditor's soul is apparently about 30 cents. Compared to Twitter's of $9 and about 50 cents, and Snapchat's of around $2. Why is that? Reddit's user base slants young and male, so less money and they use adblock. It may also be because Reddit accounts are largely disposable. Besides a username, they can be pretty bare bones. A user usually does not even need to add an email address to make one. Reddit accounts probably also collect less personal information. That can be a good or a bad thing depending on your interpretation. So there is less personal data for targeted advertising. It could also be because no one knows the exact number of fake accounts. Not even Reddit. More complicated bots are hard to tag on Reddit, so an estimate is nearly impossible. One would think Reddit, being a site that requires more complicated engagement, would dissuade bots. It is a hurdle, but not always a problem. The subreddit r slash subreddit simulator proves bots can mimic Reddit posters with a little logic. Once again, Reddit users' souls are apparently about 30 cents. Bot accounts powered up by Markov chains, logic chains, which scrape from certain subreddits, put on the performance of users interacting. It's mostly nonsense, but sometimes there's a monkeys on typewriters example of randomness producing something interesting. Back in October 2020 as well, Philip Winston discovered a bot powered by the much stronger GPT-3 Generative Pre-trained Transformer 3 had been posted on Ask Reddit for a week. It went by the username The Gentle Meter and generated a bunch of in-depth posts that received some response. Granted, it appears the creator intervened to respond to other users, but most were unaware of the original posts being by the bot. It was more proof of concept than anything. What about YouTube? It's not much better here. Faceless hordes of viewers make it even worse in some respects. Despite policies, fake views and fake subscribers still flourish on YouTube. There is very little that can actually be done due to how YouTube's impression system works. A view is a view, even if done by a bot. Fake viewership is its own YouTube cottage industry. In 2018, thevumi.com reported that they made over $1.2 million over three years by selling 196 million YouTube views across the platform. 
Facebook, in a similar fashion, has been accused, and basically admitted to, massively inflating view counts. That was under their own volition. It wasn't someone else faking it. It's not surprising when you realize YouTube undergoes waves of pruning. Very few target view numbers, though. YouTube really started removing inactive and fake accounts back in 2014. A somewhat important event in YouTube history because some channels lost an upwards of 20,000 subscribers from it, knocking them under certain subscriber goals at the time. Why the grand bot purge of 2014, though? Well, back in 2013, YouTube feared the inversion, as developers called it. What was slash is the inversion? In 2013, YouTube reported nearly half the website's traffic was bots masquerading as people. YouTube's developers feared if the percentage of bots kept increasing, YouTube's algorithm would flip. It would think bots were humans and humans were bots. The algorithms would then cater to automated bots instead of human users. The bots would become the audience. Another example of algorithms' questionable nature. The inversion never happened. Probably, but it was a possibility until the purges of 2014 attempted to adjust the website's mechanical organic demographics. YouTube is more the exception than the rule when it comes to this online, though. The majority of internet traffic is, probably, normally robots of varying types. As already covered, it's hard, if not impossible, to get numbers on internet traffic. But some have attempted estimates. In 2016, the security firm Imperva reported, by their own count, 51.8% of internet traffic was bots, and 48.2% was human. Basically the same as 2012 numbers, depending on source, but it varies. Most will say automated traffic accounts for between 50-60% to 60 depending on year. The majority of internet traffic is bots, though. The legitimate bots are those that serve a utilitarian purpose. Spiderbots index slash crawl websites for search engines, trading bots perform automated trades on merchant sites, and media bots perform your basic everyday video slash picture loading functions. Malicious bots want your personal information or to burden your website. Spam bots spam, hacker bots attempt to force access accounts for identity information, botnets create fake traffic, and download bots strip resources from websites. Imperva reckoned that the difference of legitimate and malicious bots at 22.9% to 28.9% of internet bot traffic. Imperva believes the most common type is the impersonator, believed to account for 24.3% of internet traffic. Not bot traffic, internet traffic in total. Impersonators are fake accounts and those used for denial of service attacks. Yes, in the barest interpretation, 24.3% of internet traffic is fake, or empty users. It's impossible to say how complex or smart they are in general, though. So, is the internet dead? No, lobotomized or maybe automated is a better term. Even hollow, if one will bear the reference. Facebook's FeedFetcher, itself an automated bot slash program, is believed to produce about 4.4% of all website traffic. That's just the thing that updates your dad's timeline on Facebook. Bots have become so bad 18 states prohibited automated ticket purchasing software, the first three being right at the start of the mass internet. Wisconsin in 1995, Utah in 1996, and Alaska in 1997. In 2016, the United States even passed the Better Online Ticket Sales Act, or BOTS Act, <laughs> which intended to help suppress automated mass ticket scalping. It's similar in Asia. Fake viewership and followers have become such an issue in China, the PRC, through the People's Daily, declared war on bots as a social technological issue. It's an open secret, fake, paid-for viewership is one of the pillars of the Chinese live streaming industry. Water armies, as the term apparently transliterates from Chinese, interesting, of fake bot accounts have been legislated against by the Chinese government. So it's not only the English internet which is hollow. Everywhere the web faces automization until termination. In Technopoly, Neil Postman raised the question, will the computer raise egocentrism to the status of a virtue? Yes, it definitely has, but nobody would believe it could be so solipsistic. Tools are an outgrowth of humanity. The internet is an outgrowth of tools. So, by transitive property, the internet is an outgrowth of humanity. An outgrowth of us. 
Postman's forerunner, Marshall McLuhan, said electric media is simply an outgrowth of the central nervous system. The internet, then, is where everyone's nervous systems collide. The fish cannot much see the water nor notice the pool is shrinking. You swim in websites, articles, videos, and social media posts every day, but hopefully not too much, or you'll drown. Postman feared the technopoly would produce an egocentric world, but what if the internet is undergoing ego death? Not human ego, though. Its own. Ashen One, hearest thou my voice still? This dead link leads me to give a thanks to my supporter, the Gel Samini family.